Hey there everyone, welcome to another repair. Tonight we have an excellent lullaby for you all. It should put you to sleep in a matter of seconds. We've got yet another 2141. Now I'm going to try and demonstrate to you what I think is the least risky option of doing these repairs because 2141s and A1990s, they do have a very strong representation of a signature fault. And so hopefully when you watch this, it'll give you an idea of how to approach seeing what's wrong without doing any more damage than what they already have sustained. So anyway, let's get to it and see if we can get this thing repaired. Okay, first trick with 2141s and 1990s is to not power them up. Just don't power them up. doesn't matter if you just want to check, just don't power them up. Uh, if someone else has powered it up, nothing you can do about that but don't add yourself to that list sometimes the difference between getting data back and losing it is that one more power cycle right, the most common thing you'll find with 2141s and 1990s is they've always got a bunch of dust and junk along the sides here this is what is causing the problem the the ingestion of air along with all the suspended matter in air, which unless you live in a clean room, it's inevitable. And it builds up on these corners here. And this is where the voltage regulation for the NANDs occur and it tends to cause problems. Okay, so there's some fingerprints over here. Maybe Apple's been in this one. It looks pretty good otherwise. Fair bit of dust and junk. First thing we do after this is we disconnect the battery. Use a plastic spudger. Remove the battery screw. Okay, and so we're going to go and test the various voltage rails that are frequently at fault. We're going to use continuity mode. Check PP bus on these two fuses. It's Okay, that's about right. Now we have NANDs on both sides. Some machines are only going to have it on one side. Others are going to have both. So let's see how we go. Those two little caps up here, and they almost always are going to be indicating if there is a short. And straight away we've got a short. So let's see. Point two. Point, yep. Yeah. So there's a fairly hard short so straight away we know there's a short on the NANDs that's the 2v5 side you can also check over here on the other side <laughs> you never know you might get a double hit I'm just going to check on each of these inductors everything over here looks okay at least relatively speaking. So now that we've assessed that there's definitely a problem in terms of a short, which is probably going to be corrosion related, we just take the board out. Right, the board is out. The area of the short is over here in this corner somewhere. So we'll look straight away under the microscope, see what's happening. Immediately, you can see that that lower capacitor just above the inductor has a very different sort of coloration to the one elsewhere, the matching one above it there. It's important to also take note of the fact that this regulator chip here, which is the one that feeds the two and a half volts, it doesn't have any sort of strange discoloration on it, or little oily spots or anything like that. So it's a good indication that this is a working chip. That capacitor on the other hand looks very far from working. I would say that we remove that and the short should go away. To avoid causing any undue stress to the NAND chip, we're just going to put a large block of metal over it. Keep the temperature down in that area. Check now, see if we've still got a short. 700 and rising, that's a pretty good measurement. That should be ground. So we're reading over 1K there, so that's good. We'll put a replacement cap on. 
and then we'll move and check the rest of the board. And before we put the cap on, we need to prepare the pads a little bit because they have the old lead-free solder. We want to make it slightly easier to use leaded. Let's give them a little bit of a cleanup. Put down some fresh flux. That's a little bit too much flux, but we'll have to live with that. Try to clean up some of that excess. Okay, from here what we're going to do is now check the rest of the board because while we may have found one fault it's not to say there aren't more let's just go along just use a toothbrush to brush away the slight bit of dust that's sitting there that's looking pretty good overall you see what i mean about fingerprints that i was talking about before A little bit of dust here, this is the underside. Overall it's looking quite good. Okay, so we've got the board looking pretty good, but now we've got to clean out the chassis. I'm just going to use a simple paintbrush, gently brush out the dust, and come on back and put the board back in. Okay, that's been brushed out, quite happy with that. You're never going to get it perfect, but you can make it better than it was. I'm just going to use the compressed air and just blow out the last bits of dust. Time to put it back together. The easiest way with 2141s is just use a bit of tape and hold those cables back. If you don't do this, it does make the job very frustrating. I just like to mark on the board where I have done my work so that if the machine ever comes back, I can sort of get an idea that, okay, I handled it, this is what I did. Even though I do track the job numbers, it's still nice to have a backup of indicating where you have actually done work. So I'm just going to yeah, that's all we need. Even though it seems like a little bit pedantic, I do like to, when I have it at this point, before I put the battery screw in, I like to recheck the resistances on the various important NAND rails. 99% of the time you're not going to find anything interesting it's just going to be as it as you would expect but every now and then it might just save you you may have just done something strange you forgot about and it will give you an opportunity to at least go back fix up your work rather than powering it up and ruining the machine 6700 that's good yep Yep. 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 And PP bus. Yep. So our fundamentals look pretty good at this point. It's a pretty good chance when you power it up, you should be okay. Oh, one thing I almost forgot. I like to put the Wi-Fi connectors on before I do any powering up, mostly because they've got a metallic end on them, on the end of the fly leads, so they could easily, when you're moving the machine around, touch something that they're not supposed to. Like there's a bunch of test points there. Bad luck is something that will come hunting you if you leave these things floating like that. Battery screw. Let's 
battery and data flex, connection power. So we've got our 20 volts, it's a good start, but now we've got to see if we get an Apple logo or whether we're going to get a NAND restart. And we may get one restart. The trick is to make sure we don't get repeated restarts. Okay, first thing that's got me here is that we're stuck in a 350, 370 now. It might just be that it's a very weak battery and it needs time to charge. So I'm going to keep my eye on this 358 here and see if it starts rising up a little bit. Now if it does rise up a little bit, that means then we have got a very low battery and it's just charging up slightly. Oh, we're going backwards. What's going on there? That's not right. Oh, this is a little weird. I don't know what kind of state the device was in just then. But now we can see we do have a staircase effect occurring on the current, which is what we want to see. But I don't know why we didn't see that initially. Anyway, usually when it gets to about the one amp, if it restarts, it means the NANDs are already dead. Not always, but it's a pretty common occurrence. Okay, we've gone through the one amp sort of switch phase. Incidentally, it is more of a time-related restart. It's not actually a current-related restart, but it just tends to correlate usually with by the time it hits the one amp on the charging. So this is a good sign. We're stepping up properly, but we do have to wait and see whether we get a boot. So 1.7 amps, that's pretty confident. Let's see if we get a battery logo. Nothing yet, so it could be a very flat battery. So we'll just wait, let it do its thing, and hopefully it comes up. All right, at this stage we still don't have any activity. So I'm going to make a guess here that the Apple Store, or whoever it was that worked on this previously, has tried to put it into DFU mode to try and recover it, thinking that maybe it was a software or firmware, some kind of fault like that, which was causing the machine not to come up. Now, I really wish people wouldn't do that, given that the 2141, the 1990, have such a common occurrence of this kind of fault. I think that these stores, when they get one of these machines, basically should assume the worst and think, okay, this is going to be a corrosion type issue, not a firmware issue. The mainly, the reason why I would prefer they didn't do this is because there's always a chance that we're not going to be able to get out of the DFU mode if they have put it in there for whatever reason. So I'm going to move this over to the iMac over here, plug it in, see if it shows up as DFU. And sure enough, it is in recovery mode, so I'll now proceed to try and revive it, and fingers crossed, it actually does. All right, lucky day for the customer. It does look like the revive has occurred. Let's plug it in, see if we can get a charge and a boot. That's what we want to see. Looks like we've got a win here and the customer is going to get their data back. So very happy to see that. Shut that down, give it some time to charge. Another successful 2141 repaired. And realistically, although there's plenty of stories out there about 2141s and 1990s having catastrophic failures, and a lot of them do, there is also a good portion of them that are entirely repairable and the key points are make sure you don't power it up before you do anything else with the machine. Advise the customer not to power it up. Don't try and DFU or revive mode it, okay? It's not going to do the job, better to test first. When you do get it, take the cover off, examine the resistances on the important rails for the NANDs. If it's shorted, then you know what you're dealing with. Also check PP bus. If the PP bus is shorted, then that's common as well. With Particularly on the A1990, that's quite common. Still don't power the machine up, obviously. Take the board out, examine it, repair the damage that you can see, particularly if it's shorted on the caps for the NANDs. Clean everything up best you can. 
once you feel like, okay, the NANs are safe, then you can finally power it up and hopefully you have already solved all the problems. There may be secondary issues, but at least you have put the effort in to safeguard the data that is contained on those NANs. Whether you choose to replace the capacitors or not, that will depend on where they are, which ones they are. It's going to be something you have to decide based on what you understand in the schematics, whether it's an important cap or not. There are some which are very important or it is highly recommended. There are others that aren't going to matter that much. Again, use your experience, learn what the capacitors are doing, whether they're important or not, and replace them accordingly. As a general rule, if you don't know, and if it's not too much of a technically difficult position to replace them, then definitely go and replace them. That's everything for today. We have another successful repair on A2141. Like I said, I get a lot of these every week, and most of them are successful. They're probably down to around about no more than 10% of being unrecoverable, which is a lot better than what people were saying it was in the past. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you on the next video. Until then, you all take care, and I'll catch you later. <laughs>